go about getting the students more understanding the ethical and put them in scenarios where they have to make those decisions. What I was looking at was uh, figuring out how to better diffuse the, the, the Daniel's Plan Ethic uh, Initiative uh, through, uh, through my students. So I'm a practitioner, I've been working 20 years in the telecommunications industry. And one of the things that I noticed was that sometimes you get into situations that there's no way you can actually do. Um, let me give you a couple examples. So, um, while I was doing consulting work out of Miami, uh, and a very large uh, phone manufacturer came to us and said, hey, uh, we're about to uh, come out with our results, and unfortunately we're not reaching our numbers, so could we ship to you all these uh, thousands of phones to your warehouse so we can actually invoice them? And then after the quarter is over, then we'll take them back. Okay. Um, according to them, it was completely legal. Let's say that that you do that uh, kind of things in Canada the whole time. Uh, I was just consulting, so the, the CEO from the company came to me and said, "What should we do?" I said, I, "That's completely unethical. I don't know if it's legal or not, but it's definitely completely unethical. You just take something so they can report better results, and they just take them back." Okay. So that was the situation. Uh, another one was uh, basically uh, I was working down in Argentina, uh, and uh, the Argentinian government had passed some laws saying that uh, you had to, uh, if you want to sell certain types of electronics, you had to sell them from Isuia. So you basically, it's a, Isuia it's a, it's an island south of Argentina in uh, Tierra del Fuego, and basically you had to manufacture it there. And they only gave out five licenses. So basically, people that had those licenses, which happened to be all friends of, uh, at the time was Nestor Kirchner, the president, uh, you basically had to pay them for them to license the manufacturer of the products. So a cousin, or a brother, or an uncle, or that <laughs> came to us and said, hey, I'll help you guys do that. So a small fee, $25,000, completely legal. So in Argentina, it was 100% legal. Uh, but then again, the CEO came to me and said, hey, what would you think we should do? Should we do this or not? I'm like, you are a US based company, which means that uh, technically, even though this person is just like a relative of the government, uh, it still kind of falls on the Antitrust Foreign Corruption Act, and I don't think you should be doing that, you know? Uh, and the last one, it's even an easier example, which is uh, my old boss retired, and right when he retired, one of the customers gave him a gold Rolex worth about $55,000. Now, he was retiring, which means that receiving the watch wasn't really going to affect any future decision that this gentleman could make because he was retiring, he was living for Finland, and then therefore, you know, he, he, didn't, he wasn't going to be there. But still, he actually said thank you very much, but I cannot take and accept the watch, and he just returned. Even though, thankfully, it was not going to accept, you know, affect him at all. So I start figuring out different ways to um, give these type of scenarios to the students through uh, my business courses. Uh, as, as Tracy may have mentioned, I, I, I teach quite a bit here. Uh, pretty much I'm the, the one that teaches any course that needs to be taught. <laughs> you know, so I'm the one that teaches that one. Uh, so I, I figure out how do you go about getting the, uh, the students more ethically involved uh, more understanding the ethical, you put them in scenarios where they have to make those decisions. I'm of the thought, I'm a psychologist, I'm of the thought that actually uh, by the time the student gets here, they already have a set of ethics that they have come up with. And either you reinforce them or you make them aware that there may be different ethics, but it's going to be very difficult for them to actually develop different ethical principles. They can put different names on it. Uh, but it's going to be much more difficult. Uh, so uh, I went through different ways of, of teaching them um, to recognize those ethical principles based on the Daniel's farm. Uh, so first of all, credit uh, all of the summits and all the roundtables that, that Tracy uh, puts together, they are a huge source of information. I mean, a lot of the examples, the cases, uh, they come from uh, this type of events. Uh, they usually have very good food and very good places to go to as well, you know, but uh, really the information that you, you acquire there is unbelievable, okay? Um, the other thing I like to start saying is that I like to use this model when I start teaching, which is a context challenge, activity, and feedback. 
Uh, it's a model that was developed by Allen Communications a uh, long time ago in 2014. And basically what you do is you first come up with a challenge that you're putting to the students. Then you come up with an activity that is going to reinforce that challenge. Mm -hmm. and then you ma make them think about it and you put them all within a context. Okay? And you can actually start from one side or the other. You don't need to start always with the context. You can actually start with different places. Um, and I have noticed that it makes, um, from a psychology point of view, it actually makes the students really uh, understand what you're trying to talk to them about. Okay? Um, and it's, it's pretty powerful. So let me just give you some examples uh, of how I went about doing this. My first step was figuring out, do the student even know about a D, you know, the, the Daniel Swan uh, ethics initiative? Yes, it's in every single classroom here at the, at the College of Business. Um, but if you know about uh, cues, basically anything that stay in your office or a classroom without moving for too long, your brain actually kind of forgets that it's even there. Okay? So you point them out, it's like, oh, I never noticed that there, you know? So you have to actually go through the whole thing, unfortunately. Um, this is probably why my wife moves the, you know, you have to take the garbage out of the mirror and just moves it around every day. You know, make sure I don't forget about that. Uh, but basically, uh, we talked about uh, the different ways, uh, different principles, what they mean, and can you recognize those principles in the business environment. In order to do that, um, I started with the talk, basically. So I presented all the, uh, the ethical principles, and then within groups, I told them to discuss about two different values, and to come up with examples. So you just tell me, oh, where have you actually encountered this? And that way you're putting a name in an actual behavior. One of the big things we have is we all see behaviors, but sometimes we're not able to vocalize what that behavior means. So by verbalizing what that behavior means, uh, we are attaching that to a value, and it's very powerful, okay? Uh, so just to give you some numbers, uh, so, just uh, in, the, in the fall, which I started doing this, uh, there you have some, some numbers. You know, I've also done it before. I tried it once uh, before online as well. Um, it didn't work as well because online it's a little bit more, uh, in this case it was a little bit, uh, I didn't like it. Anyways, so uh, this actually was much more powerful. Then uh, I tried it also online, but this time I did it with a case. It was a case that was discussed uh, in 2018 down in, uh, I believe it was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, about the Apple case, where they decided to change uh, people's softwares, uh, the speed of their processors without telling them anything about it. Uh, and Apple is something that is very close to the students' hearts. You know, either they hate it or they love it. You know, but don't mess around with their iPhones if they have an iPhone. Uh, so we talked about this. Uh, and I asked him to then talk, uh, try to identify which principles you could actually find here, defend them, talk about them. Uh, and the discussion was uh, fairly uh, powerful. Uh, we got a lot of good comments. Uh, people really got engaged into it. Uh, and uh, I was uh, nicely surprised that we were able to identify a lot of the principles uh, that we talked about down in, in Santa Fe. So a lot of those were actually able, were brought up uh, in there. Then the second step was able to identify and as well as actually figure out how to use them for decision making. So can you actually identify the principles and also be able to use those uh, for decision making? Uh, I use quite a bit of uh, uh, studies. So I use a lot of the studies, uh, study analysis that we have, case studies. Uh, we have uh, some of them that are, are uh, presented to us uh, from uh, the Daniels funds. Uh, so I use a couple of those. Uh, there's a lot of, of those cases that are very powerful. I also take traditional um, cases from my alma mater, Thunderbird. Uh, um, in this case, it was all about how well Reno and Nissan was doing. But we all know that Carlos Gons was actually arrested because he was accused of taking too much money. He's the president of uh, the Reno Nissan Alliance. So then I take a little bit farther. So okay, this is everything you have. You know that they did great. You know Carlos Ghosn was one of the best CEO ever, recognized, he received all kind of awards, and then now he's in the jail. Well, he's not. He actually escaped to Lebanon, uh, uh, Lebanon. but uh, he was in a jail in Japan. You know, uh, before he got inside of the 
think it was, uh, what's it called, that, uh, the base, huge base uh, case inside, and he actually stuck himself in there, and the him on a plane, and he actually took off from Japan. Uh, again, extremely successful. Uh, Renault Nissan was never as successful as Juan Carlos Gons took over, uh, but he was doing certain things. He's accused of doing certain things that were not very ethical. Uh, so we talked about all that. Uh, we'll take a little bit farther. Uh, we just used the typical uh, Harvard method of analy uh, analyzing cases. Uh, and I also do a lot of situation analysis. Uh, I make them actually get down to, okay, what was going on in the, in the market at the time? Was something that uh, was happening there that uh, was relevant? Uh, ethics is something that changes with time. So people give more weight to certain <coughs> ethical things now than maybe they did before. Does that matter, yes or no? So we have a lot of good discussions about it. Um, I assign cases, so then you start analyzing the case from different types of, uh, of, uh, of principles, so you get to actually, uh, maybe I give every single group the, the respect and fairness, but then I assign one of the other ones uh, to, to, uh, to the other group. So they have to look at it from different perspectives and tell us what to think about. And finally, um, and this is something we started doing last, last fall, I asked the students to uh, go and talk to their uh, local businesses. So we do a lot of programs with uh, local businesses. Uh, what I try to do is for them to present to them, that, okay, these are the, the ethical principles I'm using, and this is where I'm going to be based on my work that I do with you. So uh, since we have a lot of principles, I tell them to choose two or three of the most, uh, but really be very clear with them. They usually like to talk about transparency, fairness, respect, uh, those are the ones that they like to use the most. They go to those uh, local businesses and they say, okay, we're gonna be doing this work for you, this project, and these are the three uh, or four ethical principles that we're gonna be doing. So they, they have to actually figure out how they're gonna work based on those. This is some of the companies we have done over the last uh, two semesters. So last semester, which was the first semester we did it, and we only did it with uh, uh, two of the classes. Uh, we hit seven local businesses. Uh, there's a lot of breweries. This is how you realize how many breweries there's in Golar Springs by running uh, projects uh, with your students. And this semester, we're actually hitting 13 different local businesses. Um, and the reason why it's actually a bit lower, even though we're doing it pretty much in every single course, is because uh, for one of my courses, uh, I'm only doing welcome walks, uh, which is a new venture that is coming out pretty soon. So I dedicate every single team there to just work with them in different uh, aspects, okay? Uh, so different way to see how you, you operate based on principles. Instead of just uh, learning about them, reading about them, you actually have to leave them. You have to put them out there, uh, and hopefully uh, they are doing that. So just a quick summary of what you just talked about. Um, next time I'll bring more videos. Oh, I can do like that. Uh, but uh, uh, basically I wanted to make sure that uh, that the students can identify uh, and name those specific principles. Uh, a lot of times those principles are, are connected to values that they already have, but unfortunately they may not see the connection until you put them both together. So my idea here was to actually make sure that they understand uh, that the principles are values that they already, most of them already have. I uh, have not run into a student that doesn't have uh, values that are aligned with our principles. Uh, I also gave them a chance to practice them, see them in the real life, what that means from the business point of view. And I also am trying to, them, uh, trying to get them to, to be the messengers, the apostle of the, uh, the Daniels Fund uh, ethics uh, principles by taking it out there to the local business here in Colorado Springs. We work quite a bit with them. Uh, I think uh, now we're getting to a point where some businesses say, okay, not another project place. You know? uh, so we do work quite a bit uh, with local businesses. And uh, I'm just happy that they, they are talking about principles there. Okay? Uh, so that's pretty much it, the presentation. I know that uh, it's kind of late, so I just tried to rush through it. And oh, I didn't have any videos. I didn't think about the videos. So I have any videos next time. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to use a swimming one. Just that one. Any questions? Yep. So one of the observations I've had is, being a lawyer, of course, we have code of ethics. And um, in the um, population of lawyers, there 
number one in alcoholism, depression, um, some, some very significant behavioral issues, um, suicide, and bipolar disorder. Um, so I'm, I, I have a curiosity about the dissonance that you're starting to talk about here between, okay, these are the aspirations, these are universal values, right? Like they all are, um, basically, um, for a civilized society. So we all share them to some extent. Maybe a different priority. So how do we learn these things and then be able to hold them psychologically with the kind of pushback that you you have out there in the world when you enter the you know, into business communities or, um, and, you know, whatever. Whatever form of work that you do where the pushback is always efficiency and profitability, how do you hold these more amorphous kinds of goals? Uh, I mean, there's a, a couple things there. First of all, and it's just my opinion from the research I've read, you have a certain set of values by the time you get to college. So if you don't believe in those values right there, there's nothing we can do to actually make you believe in them. Uh, we can tell you you, you have to uh, abide by them and make them into rules, you know, uh, so that's all you could do. You could actually make people abide to them. But basically, uh, I think most of the time, maybe you have no idea. This happens when you are in a very young age, that you actually develop these values. It from your parents, your family, uh, your school. Um, so I, I, I work with a junior achievement. Uh, and I talk about these values uh, with middle schoolers, uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, first to bless and then afterwards if you want to pull your hair out. I just have long hair. Don't <laughs> uh, and that's something that happened. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the other two is that, that we need to have an environment where people feel comfortable enough to actually speak about this. Let me give you an example. Uh, the whole thing with Wells Fargo came out because there was one specific employee that actually, she went and said, this is wrong. She went to HR, it just said, stop rocking the boat, uh, because as part of the performance appraisal and everything else, uh, she went to her boss, so the boss said, stop rocking the boat. So finally she went to uh, the ethic groups that reversed the, the banks, I guess, and told them about it, and that's when everything started. She got fired. She hasn't been able to actually work in the banking industry since she blew the whistle. Uh, so when you start seeing that there's an environment like that, as a, if you were a young student that just got hired and you're seeing something that is not very ethical, I, you're gonna think, okay, do I wanna speak up or not? I mean, I'm just starting my days, everybody's doing it. You know, is this good or bad? Um, so the, it's us, it's everybody, society who has to actually say, hey, tell me what's going on and you're not gonna be punished. This is actually what we should be telling the students. This is the, the society we should be uh, one of the things that uh, I was shocked is that it was the CEO asking me, I was a consultant, you know, the CEO asking me, should I be doing this? Like, dude, I'm not, you know, what's the other called of that Disney thing, the cricket thing, the, uh, the, the cricket, uh, your conscience, the cricket, whatever. Jimmy Cricket. Jimmy Cricket. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm not your conscience. <laughs> it was like, you, you should be telling me, hey, I decided this, what do you think about that? And, that could be my opinion, but you shouldn't be asking me. I'm just a consultant here, you know. Uh, for them to have to ask somebody else, is this okay to do? Uh, I thought that was not the right way. You know, that was not, that, that showed that there was something missing there. Okay, that's why I terminated the project as soon as I couldn't get out of there, you know. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, there's no easy question for that. Right. So, I mean, a lot of the things you mentioned is actually related with burnout too as well. So it's related with the burnout. So oh. just the fact that you're just doing too many hours, you are just focusing too much on work and stuff like that. So, yeah. So I have a question, and it's an extension of Pippa's question. So you said by the time they get to college, they've already uh, established their, you know, their own ethical principles and their mm -hmm. behaviors. But new situations come up all the time where they may have established those principles, but it's a matter of applying them, okay? Yeah. 
So one technology in particular that has come up in the last, what, 10, 15 years, that it seems like in every conversation we kind of gloss over it. So I figure this is good a venue as any to not gloss over it. These things, okay? And how it's affected our behaviors, our relationships, and arguably our psychology. So how do we use these principles and apply that to people's behaviors, relationships, and behaviors, psychology? How do we do that? I mean, you said yourself that you know you bring it up in class and the students are like, hey, you know, that's sacred territory. Don't touch my cell phone. Yeah. So how do we how do we bridge mm -hmm. that gap? How do we have that conversation? Uh, well, let's start with another example. So you know that uh, Apple case that I told you about a second ago. They did a study where they asked uh, people, uh, "Do you think that Apple's a good company?" You know, and uh, most people said yes. I think Apple's a good company. And I told them about everything about the case. So this is what they just did. Uh, do you still think that they're a good company? And they said yes. They're still a good company. Mm -hmm. So basically, they were forgiven the behavior that one of their brands did because that's one of their brands. Then they asked them, what do you think is a bad company? And said, any kind of cable company. You know, Comcast, or anything like that, those are bad. You know, now, Comcast that I know of have, hasn't done any unethical things lately that, that hasn't been in the news, at least. Yeah. Uh, but automatically, they go to Comcast. So, um, so that's something that, uh, um, that shows that ethics isn't always aligned with, with the behaviors that we see. This is why I wanted to sh really yeah. focus on the, the behaviors but actually are able to identify ethical behaviors versus non-ethical behaviors. Amen. Um, on the mobile phone, I don't know. I don't really have an answer. I don't know if anybody else has an answer how to use that. Uh, See, once again, every conversation, we kind of dismiss it and move on. But people's, you know, people are driving, texting and driving. It's mm -hmm. causing accidents. It's killing people. Yeah. Um, people are just walking into other people on the street because they're looking at their cell phone and not paying attention to where they're going. But I mean, I'm thinking of my daughters, and I've never told them anything about this. But all my daughters have a thing that when they're driving, uh, you get a message from them saying, I'm driving right now, I can run to my cell phone. I never told them about it. They figure out that themselves, them, you know, their friends, and uh, their friends use it as well. So basically, they know that they should not be on their phones when they're driving. Now, is that kind of screw value that they have? Or I never mentioned anything about it. I worked in the mobile industry, mobile for Nokia for 17 years, making cellular phones. Uh, when we first came out with the cameras, my wife said that's the worst thing I ever have to society when everybody's gonna have a camera in their pocket. And I said, don't exaggerate. Now I have to tell her to drive, which is very hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, it's. I don't know. It's with any technology, there's always abuses. Okay. It, um, it would be interesting to ask those questions in the early 1900s, right? When you're talking about the introduction of phones. In the industrial well. age. Right. Exactly. Because this is not the first time that you know a technology has really disrupted how people interact. Suddenly, right? We, we complain today about the change of jobs, right? But messenger boys suddenly were not nearly as needed when you had telephones anymore, right? Like a whole industry went away. Or now, once we got rid of party lines, you didn't need those telephone operators, right? So so what kinds of changes happened and how did people adjust, right? But, so I think, I think you're asking the right questions, but I think there also might be some interesting parallels in history to look at. There are absolutely parallels in history. But we are we have 2020 hindsight. You know, 20 years later we have perfect vision on what we could have, should have, would have done. Mm -hmm. But when it's happening, our vision is not not only is our vision not as clear, but sometimes we just we're ignorant, we dismiss it. We say, you know, oh, that's somebody else's problem, not my problem. Until you get in a car accident because somebody was texting and driving. I mean, the conversation on this is just starting. 
government, local, state, well, mostly local and state governments are just starting to realize that we need laws, you know, against texting and driving. We need laws, uh, uh, or at least raise the awareness of what it's doing to us, our relationships, you know? You see kids in strollers, you know, looking at their cell phones, and they, they say the most formative ages for kids is, uh, you know, between, what, four and six years old. And you see these four and six years old just doing this. But it, but is that because of the cell phone, is that because of social media? Is what? Is that because of social media, is that because of the cell phone? I mean, that's the... Well, the two technologies go hand in hand, in my opinion. If it's not a cell phone, it's, a, it's an iPad. Yeah. Okay. But it's a screen, nonetheless. So, rather than glossing over this, I figure we are here at a major university. Um, and we are having a discussion on ethics. Let's not gloss over it anymore. Let's address it. Okay? Because it's an issue that... The, faces us, every single one of us, every single day. Well, I know, for example, my daughter's high school, uh, you get extra money when you walk in, you put your cell phone in one of those, like the shoe things mm -hmm. that you have behind the doors, and you put it there. I also have seen studies that uh, they measure anxiety, and the anxiety of the students go through the roof when you actually separate them from their devices. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd rather have them with their device and tell me I'll give you a break every 45 minutes, mm -hmm. so you can check your whatever you need to check that is so important, you know. Um, so what does that tell you about the technology when people are having emotional and physical anxiety when they're separated from a device? What does that tell you about the technology? It tells, it tells me something, and I'm not even a medical professional. Yeah, it could be, I mean, it will be interesting to see. So, last point, and then I'll, I'll shut up. So another technology that is just coming on board, autonomous vehicles. So recently there was an incident, I believe it was in California, but I can't be sure. So a guy was riding in an autonomous vehicle. I don't know if it was a test vehicle or if they're legalized, you know, wherever this happened or what. The guy is riding in an autonomous vehicle. And the vehicle's driving itself, and he's on his cell phone. And he crashed. He killed somebody. That's your wife, son, daughter, sister, brother. All of a sudden, that becomes meaningful to you. Okay. Um, so, where's, at what point did we or should we have applied the ethical principles in that situation? I mean, there's already conversation about that. You know, if, uh, if you are inside that vehicle and that vehicle actually or somebody else whose fault is that. Um, I think in the case nowadays it's pretty clear because that guy, there is actually a steering wheel. Uh, even Tesla tells you do not take your hands off the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that if you see that it's going towards the wall, then you can correct it, you know, because the wall is never good with uh, your car, okay? Uh, but there is a lot of conversation about, okay, so once everything is working like it should, uh, what if the vehicle finds itself in a situation where it has to either run over somebody or run over just one person versus three, you know, how does it choose, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, so, I mean, there's already that conversation, I don't know if we're going to find the solution personally. You know, it's going to be very difficult. Yeah. So, so we can sit here and say, we can read about it in the paper and dismiss it until it happens to one member of our family. Yeah. And then it all of a sudden becomes important. I prefer to take the other approach. Let's not wait until we have to say, oops, you know, that's something we should have thought about. You don't have to go that far. I mean, right now with the whole uh, COVID-19, uh, if you actually get sick, and they have to put your respirator, you need a very specific type of respirators, and there's not enough respirators anywhere in, in the world to actually be able to put everybody there. Which means that if you actually have a lot of people that need it, you're gonna have to make a choice on who actually gets it. So you don't even need to get there. You know, uh, fortunately, those situations are going to happen. So how they're going to take the in the old times used to be, you know, women and children first, and then let the men just sunk with a vote. You know, <laughs> is that going to happen nowadays? 
they're going to say, hey, take the younger person versus the older person. How do you make those ethical decisions? That's, you know, and somebody has to live with that too, by the way. Yeah, that's right. Sure do.